Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live webinar, Impact of Global Viral Surveillance on Diagnostic Tools. Presented by Dr. Gavin Cloherty, Head of Infectious Disease Research, Abbott Diagnostics. My name is Christy Jewell, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by Labroots and brought to you by Abbott Diagnostics. To learn more about our sponsor, please click on the Abbott logo on the far left of your screen. Now, before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We will answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. Now, if you have any trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the support tab found at the top right of the presentation window. Or you can use the ask a question box to let us know you're experiencing a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the continuing education credits tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. I now present today's speaker, Dr. Gavin Cloherty, Head of Infectious Disease Research, Abbott Diagnostics. Dr. Cloherty graduated from the National University of Ireland, Galway, where he received his PhD in Molecular Biology and a Bachelor of Science in Microbiology and Zoology. He provides scientific leadership in the areas of infectious disease diagnostics, by leading groundbreaking clinical studies in hepatitis and HIV. As one of the top experts in the field, his innovative research is changing the way infectious diseases are being diagnosed to help improve patient outcomes. For a complete biography on Dr. Cloherty, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Dr. Cloherty, you may now begin your presentation. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, and hello, everybody. Um, today, we're going to talk about the impact of global surveillance on diagnostic tools. I'm going to jump right in. The mission of our surveillance program is to keep pace with viral diversity and emerging strains that pop up around the world. We establish genetically and geographically diverse specimen panels that are used in assay development and regulatory submissions. These are really um, the bar that all of our tests must, must uh, cross before they're able to uh, go to market. And also, it enables our tests to, uh, to ensure that our tests detect diverse HIV and hepatitis strains regardless of where they're found um, or where the infections were acquired. I like this slide because it shows uh, you know, Abbott's uh, legacy in HIV. Um, basically, this, these uh, photographs show the teams that developed the first ever uh, FDA-approved HIV assay. And interestingly, interestingly if you look at uh, the bottom uh, picture, the two people in the center, Robin Gutierrez uh, and George Dawson, um, are still part of the team today that are uh, developing uh, HIV and hepatitis and other infectious disease assays. And this slide uh, here further illustrates Abbott's legacy in, in infectious disease. Again, in the bottom, you'll see in 1985, we launched the first ever HIV assay. And in the top, uh, in the hepatitis line, uh, we actually launched the first uh, hepatitis B surface antigen assay significantly earlier in the early 70s. But what's uh, significant here is we continue to innovate and don't uh, rest on our laurels. So you can see all of the different um, hepatitis and HIV assays and versions of assays that have been uh, developed and launched throughout the decades. If we talk about um, diversity, we're going to use uh, HIV as an example um, of how uh, genetic diversity uh, can impact viral diagnostics. And in this slide, you see there have been four separate zoonotic infections, so infections from our primate uh, cousins, both chimpanzees and gorillas, have led to four different groups of HIV virus, four different types, if you like, um, that in some ways are obviously very similar in the disease, uh, but in, in genetically, they can be very different. Um, the group M infections, which came, formed the majority of the global uh, pandemic, came from chimpanzees 
um, but you can see that group P and group O um, are very different. The length of these lines uh, represents the amount of genetic difference between these, these strains, and in some regions of group um, O, uh, there are only about 50% genetic identity to um, the subtype B of group M, which is the major uh, subtype that, form, that infects um, people in North America and uh, Northern Europe. And also bring your attention to the fact that there are 45 other non-human primate species, so we have to be continuously alert uh, and uh, aware of the fact that other zoonotic transmissions may uh, occur and uh, form a threat to uh, human health. So looking at HIV more specifically, um, there are three major sources of genetic diversity in, for the HIV virus. The first is that this virus replicates at a very high level, um, and it has an error-prone replication process that does not correct any mutations that may occur. We talked previously in the, the previous slide about the different starting points, so you have the different zoonotic infections. So there's a large amount of difference um, in, in those starting points. Finally, um, the HIV virus can infect um, the cell, so different strains of HIV can infect the same individual, and in fact, they can infect the same cell. And if you get um, different strains of HIV in the same cells, you see in this, uh, the bottom of this slide, we have HIV genome A and HIV genome B in the same cell. Sections of the nucleic acid can break off and recombine, uh, so you get an additional shuffling of the deck, and you get a recombinant virus that actually contains a mosaic of the genetic material of the two uh, viruses present in the cell. These are becoming increasingly more common and forming uh, the, the majority of epidemics in certain parts of the world. This slide illustrates the exceptional genetic diversity of HIV, and we look at it in the context of other um, infections we, we commonly hear about. So if you look on the left-hand side of this slide, you've got influenza H3N2, and this um, uh, represents all of the genetic diversity found globally in 1996 of this influenza virus. On right beside it, we see one individual. So this is the amount of genetic diversity found in one individual with HIV that is longitudinally sampled over a few years. Beside that, in Amsterdam, we see the amount of genetic diversity in roughly 25 individuals. This is a one-time point looking at, sub, they're all subtype B, so they're relatively close, um, but on a, on a scale when you look at influenza, they're extremely uh, diverse. And then in, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, 196 samples shown here on the right-hand side. They're all group M, so no group N or O or P. So they're all group M, but they're not all subtype B. But again, you see an immense amount of genetic diversity that really dwarfs the global um, influenza diversity seen in 1996. So it's a very challenging uh, pathogen to work with and develop robust tools for. How does HIV stack up relative to hepatitis B and hepatitis C? Well, on this slide, you can see that um, Hep B has a similar amount of genetic diversity to HIV, um, but hepatitis C actually dwarfs HIV, which, as you saw in the previous slide, dwarfed influenza. So hepatitis C has a lot of diversity, Hep B similar to HIV, but in general, these three viruses are a very challenging group to work with. Why do we care so much about this genetic diversity, um, particularly from the diagnostic side? You can see from this slide on the right-hand side, um, if we think about molecular assays, their ability to function uh, relies on primers and probes binding to specific sequences on the virus genome. Um, and if you have mutations on that viral genome, that can impact the ability of primers and probes to bind and a PCR reaction to work and a, and a result to be obtained. Um, similarly, the serology assays will detect proteins uh, or antibodies, and these are encoded by the DNA of the virus. So you can see, uh, well, the antibodies aren't encoded by the virus, obviously, it's by the host immune uh, system. But the uh, proteins encoded in the, the DNA can be impacted by mutations, which then can impact the ability of serology assays to detect them. Again, looking more 
uh, at a case as to why this genetic diversity matters. We, we see here a report of the identification of a group um, P infection uh, from a 62-year-old woman who was from the Cameroon, who was residing in France, who was found to be HIV positive, and it was Western blot uh, confirmed when she arrived at Par in Paris. It was not detected by the viral load assay that was being used at the time. That was a monitor 1.5 assay. But it was detectable, and there was significant viremia when the Abbott real-time HIV assay was uh, used. Uh, there was about 4.5 to 5.5 logs copies per mil, um, and the, there were several samples that were archived that were tested, and that explains the different um, numbers. Um, Importantly, the Abbott Architect HIV combo assay was also positive. When this uh, site tried to figure out what was going on, they suspected Group O, and, but it um, was not possible to amplify this sample with Group O specific primers or Group M specific primers. But it was successfully amplified and sequenced eventually, and uh, it was identified as the first ever Group P infection in the world. Again, we showed that slide earlier, which, um, which indicated that Group P came from gorillas um, from our originally. What was, what's important to note about this slide is that both the Abbott real-time and the architect assays were not developed with Group P in mind because it, didn't, it wasn't known about. But it accurately um, both detected and quantitated this virus because of the way these assays are designed and because of our focus on global viral diversity. So talking about the Abbott Global Surveillance Program more specifically, this program has been in place for uh, over 25 years, focuses primarily on hepatitis and um, HIV and other retroviruses. Um, and really, it's, it was spawned from uh, HIV uh, Group O. As we've shown earlier, Abbott had the first ever FDA-approved um, HIV assay, and it worked very well until Group O came along, and then it didn't work quite as well because of the amount of genetic diversity of Group O. So Abbott implemented the Global Surveillance Program to get ahead of this and be proactive and to ensure that uh, we stay one step ahead of this constantly changing um, epidemic. As we mentioned earlier, we monitor the emergence of new viral strains, and we um, establish well-characterized panels that um, are really used to challenge all of the assays that we develop here at Abbott. So we keep an eye on what's happening um, in, the, in the world to make sure that the tests that we have on market are functioning as they should, and also that the tests that we're uh, developing will continue to meet the challenge of that uh, evolving epidemic over the coming years. Um, one interesting point um, is that this uh, program is extremely collaborative and also um, outgoing, if you like, as is indicated by the more than 125 peer-reviewed publications that have come from this um, program, and also the amount of sequence. As you know, if you publish, you really have to upload the sequence to GenBank, so um, thousands of these rare sequences have been uploaded to GenBank to help other researchers and help move the field forward. Um, to date, we've archived about 70,000 samples from 45 countries on six continents, so we're trying to really sample the world as much as is possible. Um, and these are the 70,000 kind of unusual samples uh, from unusual places. So this slide illustrates uh, where the global surveillance program has been. And if you, you can imagine why we try to sample the world, you can't be everywhere all the time. So we take an approach of like a, a rolling um, approach or roving approach rather, where we, we're, we, we will sample in specific locations and then move around to try and uh, sample others. And here we, we also will go to areas of high immigration like Paris or London or uh, Madrid. Uh, to try and, if you can't be everywhere, you can be where everybody's going through at least, to try and get an idea of what's going on around the world. As you see this slide changing, um, it shows where we're currently working. Uh, we've, we've been working a lot in Asia Pacific recently, Central Asia, more in, in uh, West and Central Africa, um, a little bit in Europe too. And then as we move into the future, we're going to continue uh, some of our work in um, 
Asia, the Indian subcontinent, Africa, and we'll continue to move around the world to try and understand how the epidemic is, is changing. I'm going to illustrate a little bit of our work and uh, with, with uh, an example of India. And this uh, collaboration has a unique challenge because usually um, we will get samples from all over the world shipped to our facilities here at Chicago and uh, we'll do the characterization here, but you can't get samples out of India. So we've been collaborating with YR Gaetan Center for AIDS Research and Education, um, and they're located in Chennai. Um, they're a fantastic group of collaborators that have a, a network um, all over India. Um, they service uh, at-risk, high-risk populations such as MSM and people who inject drugs. Um, they um, Ha we, we, they collect uh, samples and we use the leftover samples for our work. And to date, um, we've looked at over 1,000 samples. We've generated about 1,300 sequences. And what's been interesting is that we found that a lot of the HIV and hepatitis uh, strains uh, track with the drug routes around India, whether they're coming from uh, Asia or coming from um, you know, Afghanistan and that kind of uh, Indian Indian area or more towards the, the European side. So it's uh, kind of interesting to see how the virology tracks with, uh, with these other epidemics such as uh, drug use and, uh, and um, that type of thing. And the, the program works by initially screening with rapid tests and then in the core lab, you know, HIV combo is used or core antigen or anti-HCV in the case of hepatitis C. And then uh, viral load is performed in the center of the lab and sequencing goes from there where samples are, uh, have a high enough viral load for sequencing. The Democratic Republic of Congo um, is, is different in that the samples, again, they can come to Chicago. And we've been working with Carl MacArthur um, and the University Protestant in Congo to get leftover samples that are shipped to Chicago for screening and sequencing of HIV, Hep B, Hep C, and Hep Delta. Um, what was interesting about the uh, findings so far in, in, in Congo is that we find a lot of um, subtypes. So subtype A, C, J, K, pure subtypes, which in many other parts of the world you don't, you don't find them very often, and finding pure subtypes like this is also quite rare. We also found a lot of circulating recombinant forms that we discussed earlier um, and are listed here in a few unique recombinant forms too. And to date, we've, sequen we've received about 5,500 samples, generated about uh, 200 sequences. And um, I think one of the uh, key um, uh, take-homes is that we're going to be doing more sequencing to get closer to a few thousand sequences from uh, Congo, so we'll have more to report shortly. In China, again, it's similar to India in that samples can't come out of China, but we've set up some collaborations with uh, blood transfusion centers, uh, IBT in Chengdu, and the National Center for Clinical Laboratories, um, NCCL in Beijing. Um, the, one of the studies with IBT looked at the performance of um, CMIA versus EIA in the transfusion space and found that one CMIA performed better than one or two EIAs, had better concordance to Western blot, gave lower false positives and false negatives. In addition, we got these samples and we also sequenced many of them. Um, we gen so far, we've generated um, 834 sequences. Uh, from 1,800 samples that we've received, um, and that's both from NCCL and uh, IBT. And what's remarkable about the Chinese samples is there's um, a la not a whole lot of diversity uh, found there, but we did find some um, circulating recombinant forms which are most commonly associated with Africa in uh, Shaanxi province, in blood donors from that province. So that was uh, an interesting find from this work in China. In Vietnam, we're collaborating with the blood transfusion services there uh, to do general surveillance. Um, and in addition, we're working with the Ministry of Health and also the US CDC, the WHO, and other stakeholders to conduct the first ever comprehensive viral hepatitis um, zero survey of that country, uh, where 28,000 people will be screened. Um, and this 
the collection has been conducted, the testing has been done, and now the data will be compiled. And this will be very useful for this um, country and the Ministry of Health to develop um, plans to tackle their viral hepatitis epidemic. Others, other collaborations which are ongoing at different phases, if you like, um, include work with the Pakistan Transfusion Services. That study um, is well underway. The samples have been collected and shipped to Chicago for characterization. In Uganda, with their blood transfusion service, um, that is starting off and with the testing is beginning um, and samples are being collected as we speak. In Namibia, uh, we're in the earlier stages, more the logistics side of things. So 25 years of uh, discovering rare and emerging strains. Um, what, here's a little kind of some of the highlight reel of that, if you like. So in 1994, the surveillance program was initiated uh, looking primarily at HIV. Hepatitis B was added in 2009, um, and in 2011, uh, our surveillance program identified the second, only the second case of HIV group P that has ever been discovered was identified um, from our uh, cohorts of uh, Cameroonian samples which we had in the freezer. So when the sample was first identified by Simone in, in Paris uh, from a woman from Cameroon, we decided to go back into the archive samples of Cameroon, uh, Cam from Cameroon to look for group P and in fact we found one case. Um, in 2014, Hep C was added to, this, to the surveillance program, and in 25, uh, 2015, um, a novel PEGI virus was discovered uh, in a Hep C uh, positive sample, and uh, this PEGI virus um, kind of clusters close to rat and bat PEGI virus. Uh, was in a, a woman who, as I said, was hepatitis C positive. It, it appears to be somewhat associated with Hep C, but we're still trying to um, really tease apart the clinical significance of this finding and its association with hepatitis C. In 2016, hepatitis Delta was added to uh, the surveillance program, as was the novel PEGI virus that we found, because we wanted to understand, um, you know, is this PEGI virus found uh, more broadly in the world? And hepatitis delta is extremely important um, as a co-infection of hepatitis B, and so understanding its uh, prevalence globally and its diversity uh, is extremely important from a public health perspective. And again, in 2017, um, a rare HTLV3, only the fifth ever case of HTLV3 was identified in, in Cameroon, as was uh, some additional group N samples, which are very rare also. And Recently, we've been focusing a lot of effort uh, to optimize and uh, develop next generation techniques uh, that uh, form us a robust solution for our um, surveillance program, and we'll talk a little bit about that in some subsequent slides. So here we see an illustration of a before and after. So before 2015, our surveillance program uh, was carried out using traditional Sanger sequencing. So to subtype, we would sequence three different regions. If we wanted to get a whole genome, we'd have to do a lot more sequencing of, uh, to fill out that genome. This process would take about one to four weeks for a sample and require about anywhere up to 35 PCR reactions. Uh, you had to really have some prior knowledge of the strain you were looking at and, and um, designing the appropriate uh, primers was uh, extremely important. After 2015, um, using universal uh, NGS techniques with universal HIV or random priming, uh, we were able to multiplex 30 samples. The technique would take, you know, up to four days, one reaction per sample, and had an extremely uh, good uh, track record for getting whole genomes from samples with low viral load. Here we see um, some of the outputs of that, as was published by Mary Rogers in Virology in 2017. We had uh, 524 uh, diverse sequences um, sequenced using these next-gen methods, and we were able to get 98% coverage of uh, group N uh, samples and 24 uh, group O samples as well, which is uh, remarkable. 401 mostly genotype A or E sequences were generated from HEP-B samples, again with an um, average of 84% coverage. HTLV, which is a very rare uh, infection, uh, we were able to get 80% coverage of the 
uh, HDLV3, which was only the fifth case ever found of HDLV3. And for HCV, 103 sequences, they were mostly genotype 4, were processed and um, primarily from older participants. And this, uh, all these samples came from Cameroon, again, uh, with a high degree of uh, coverage for these samples. One method that's recently been published by Mike Berg um, is called XGen, and it's a universal target capture for HIV. And this uses the traditional um, NGS approach, but where the difference comes in is um, Mike created um, thousands of probes which were specific to HIV, which then enriched the sample and the pooled libraries for HIV sequences um, and give a much better um, success rate for uh, getting whole genomes and from low viral load samples. So here we see an example of that. Um, on the left-hand side is the HIV uh, group subtype G sample with a viral load of about three and a half logs. And you can see the SMART um, approach, more traditional uh, NGS approach, um, had very low depth and had reasonable coverage. But using the enrichment with XGen, you get almost complete genome and very robust depth in this sample. Um, again, it's a, it's a very powerful technique. As you see on the right-hand side, we're able to get almost whole genomes um, from samples that have a significantly lower viral loads uh, than using the, the uh, traditional NGS techniques with no enrichment. Um, even down to log three and below, you get a significant amount of genome coverage where you would have had a negative result without this enrichment. And above uh, log 3.5, you get almost whole genomes um, most of the time. And again, this is without any prior knowledge of what strain or sequence you're dealing with. It also works for other uh, viruses, as is illustrated here. On the top left, you see hepatitis B um, with and without uh, this XGen approach of, of enrichment. So you get almost a whole genome for hepatitis B with no prior knowledge of what you've got relative to rather sporadic coverage uh, without the XGen coverage. For hepatitis delta, remarkable difference. You get very little coverage um, and depth without um, XGen, but you get pretty much the whole genome um, with XGen in this case. And on the bottom slide, these two panels show <coughs> uh, pegivirus, the novel pegivirus on the left-hand side here. Um, you, you can really clearly see you get whole genome coverage and remarkable depth. And on the right-hand side, um, where you had more sporadic coverage, you get almost whole genome. The depth isn't as great, but you get the whole genome and, and quite significant uh, depth as well. So the impact of global surveillance um, is significant. We want to we want to illustrate that. And here we have a case study. Um, of a woman who was um, a, kid, a kidney dialysis patient. She had been vaccinated, and in 2010, her anti-HBS uh, titer was 82 milli IUs per mil. She was surface antigen negative. In 2016, she was hospitalized and was tested as surface antigen positive. Um, she hadn't been dialyzed in a separate room or on a separate machine um, between 2010 and 2016. And so this means that uh, without knowing when her, she uh, became positive and had a vaccine breakthrough um, infection. It's not possible to know how many other people were potentially exposed who were dialyzed on, in the same room and on the same machinery. In 2017, a further um, analysis uh, revealed that her viral load was 14 million. Um, her surface anti-HBS was 114 milli IU. Um, she was positive by one test and um, negative by another. The positive test was the architect, the Abbott Architect test. Um, and when they did the sequencing, they found a common surface antigen uh, GLIAR a mutation at position 145. Um, and the, the, the um, authors um, did a subsequent survey and found nine out of 23 labs they tested used methods that uh, would not commonly detect this surface antigen mutant. So this is a, a clear illustration of why keeping an eye on, on mutants um, are, is important for hepatitis B. Uh, this uh, study published, or case study published by Hendricks et al. and MMWR um, you know, was, was, was thorough and um, is a vindication, if you like, as to why Abbott pays so much um, attention to this, uh, this topic. 
Uh, interesting to note that this uh, case was found, uh, I believe it was uh, Nebraska or that part of the United States of Central America, not Central United States, not Central America, I'm sorry, um, but uh, not in a high uh, immigrant population such as, let's say, New York or Chicago or Miami, so found in, in Middle America. Um, another impact uh, for the surveillance program here, more of a public health one, uh, was the identification of a new hepatitis B genotype I in Thailand. This had only previously been shown in China and Vietnam, and you can see in the bottom panels, you can see a, a, a clear break uh, point uh, where you, you have a recombination. Um, and the clusters with uh, genotype C, but it is distinctly different. Uh, it is a, a, a novel genotype. Um, so this shows that the this is becoming more pervasive around uh, this part of Southeast Asia and China, important from a public health perspective. As we can see in this slide, it's an example of how our surveillance program is, is put into action. And you can see uh, the performance of a, a host of different assays, including our current on-market uh, surface antigen qual assay, as, as well as our next generation surface antigen next qualitative assay and the relative performance of these tests um, in uh, very diverse and uh, samples that contain uh, surface antigen escape mutants. And you can see um, on the top line our next generation surface antigen test is performing um, quite well and outperforming our existing um, assay and uh, that of, of some of our comparators. Back to HIV, um, you know, what about the U.S.? Uh, this study was performed between 2011, uh, 2004 and 2011, and it's interesting that in this time frame, people really thought that the um, North American epidemic was all subtype B, group M subtype B. Uh, but this collaboration uh, with ARUP looked at the sequence of samples that went through this reference laboratory um, over this time and found that um, there was about 3.27% uh, were non-B strains, um, and this was uh, sampled from 37 states. It also illustrated that the prevalence of non-B strains, um, including a lot of circulating recombinant forms, as you can see from this slide, um, was increasing between 2004 and 2011, and by 2011 that had gone up from 3.27% to 4.12% and is, continues to increase to this day. So I think um, obviously you can see the, the diversity is high in Texas, California, Miami, um, and around the Chicago and the mid Midwest area and, and up in uh, New England as well. So in our surveillance program in Africa, we have focused a lot on um, Central and West Africa, and in particular in Cameroon, has been a very productive and fertile area for looking at genetic diversity. And the reason for that um, is its uh, proximity to non-human primates, particularly non-human primates where uh, simian uh, gor uh, gorilla and um, chimpanzee uh, simian Im immunodeficiency virus or the air version of HIV has been found. So you can see the collection sites are all in, in South uh, Cameroon and there's many non-human primates uh, colonies and many of them do uh, harbor these infections. So we've been working there since 2011 and actually this slide's a bit dated because we're still working there, so 2011 to 2019. Um, and at these sites, uh, 22 sites in total, they collect about 6 mils of blood and they uh, turn that into, into plasma. Um, it's, it's collected at voluntary testing campaigns, antenatal clinics, um, it's collected from patients who present with um, illness of unknown etiology or by door-to-door -door recruitment. And annually we receive about 3,000 samples, two to 3,000 samples as part of this study. And we get about anywhere from one to three mils. And sometimes a one mil sample can be quite challenging, particularly if you find something interesting that's not a lot of volume to work with. And to date, um, we have more than 14,000 samples uh, collected and screened. Actually, that's getting closer to probably 18,000 now. Um, some of the major findings that we've uh, attributed to this uh, collaboration has been the finding of uh, group M, N, and O samples. Uh, we find that in this part of Cameroon, uh, there's about 10% uh, hepatitis B prevalence, and 15% of those escape uh, or possess um, escape mutations to surface antigen. 
Uh, HTLV is found at about 1%. And again, this is the collaboration where we found uh, only the fifth ever case of HTLV3 globally. And again, we do upload sequences to GenBank. So about 1,000 sequences have been uploaded to GenBank from this collaboration alone. We've also been leveraging this longitudinal data and this um, archive of samples to understand the prevalence of viruses, more epidemiological um, work. And in Cameroon, we looked at um, samples collected who were hepatitis B positive over those years, and we had about 19 uh, 100 samples with sufficient volume to screen for hepatitis delta. And again, hepatitis delta is a virus that is uh, very aggressive, and if you're positive for delta, it's uh, poor prognosis, more rapid progression to cirrhosis and cancer with a higher mortality rate. And what was shocking, and made us do a double take, is when we looked at this data, uh, there was more than 45% of these B positives um, were delta antibody positive. So if we think that Cameroon has about 10% uh, B in the samples that we've collected and, and screened, then that would mean you've got almost 5% of the population harbors the, the Delta co-infection. And of those, 35% um, were viremic, meaning there's active replication of the virus in these, in these patients. So that's um, quite um, astounding. And our findings have recently been um, replicated or validated, if you like, by a, a national survey that was conducted by the Institute Pasteur. Um, we also sequenced all the samples that were RNA positive uh, with sufficient viral load to get a sequence, and we found um, a wide variety from one to eight. Um, we got several, uh, we uploaded about uh, 300 whole genomes and many, many more, similar number of almost whole genomes. So we've significantly increased the amount of sequence uh, that's available glo globally um, from hepatitis delta from this, this uh, study. We also looked at hepatitis C um, from these uh, from samples we had in the freezer from Cameroon over the years. And um, the findings, again, were remarkable, and these were uh, published in 2018. Uh, what we found was that the overall prevalence of uh, HCV viremia with an RNA assay was about 2.5%. This was significantly lower than the percentages that had been quoted to me before uh, of a prevalence of 15% or 11% in Cameroon. So we find that the real number is more around 2.5%. We also found two interesting uh, biases, if you like. There was a definite uh, bias towards males. So men were almost twice as likely to be positive as women. Uh, as you can see in the top right-hand uh, panel, females were two, around 2% 2 prevalence and males were about 3.8% prevalence. Uh, we also found an age effect. So although most of the samples were collected from people who were l less than 40 years old, the vast majority of the HCV positive infections were found in people who were more than 40 years old. This is um, important from a, a public health perspective. If somebody wanted to try and tackle hepatitis C in Cameroon, they would do well to tackle people who are over 40 or over 50 and focus on men, maybe in a cl clinical setting. And looking at co-infections, 40% um, of the HCV positives were also HIV positive. There was a, not a lot of Hep B co-infection. About 3.6% of the HCVs were, were Hep B co-infected. And um, only about 14% had the PEGI virus uh, antibody uh, in, in, their, in their blood. So this would uh, kind of lend you to think that um, similar routes of transmission might be um, at play in HIV and hepatitis C epidemic in Cameroon, and also, if, again, if you wanted to stratify target populations to screen and treat, uh, HIV uh, clinical settings might be a good place to go. Looking at um, diversity as it affects diagnostic tests, here um, Mary Rogers uh, published in 2018 the impact of uh, significant amounts of um, mismatches on 
the Abbott real-time viral load assay. And what was remarkable is we were able to, sh to see that um, this assay was re incredibly robust, even to group P, as we showed earlier, um, group N, uh, and various other circulating recombinant forms that have up to five or six mismatches to their primers and probes. The assay is not impacted and gives an accurate and robust result. Um, again, also the architect assay um, accurately detects all of these extremely diverse samples, um, validating the importance and utility of this uh, program. As I indicated earlier, it's a very collaborative and uh, outward-looking uh, program, and we've published about 125 papers. Um, some of them are highlighted here, such as the identification of the second group P infection in the world, uh, the identification and discovery of the novel PEGI virus, uh, Mike Berg's um, next-gen sequencing methods, the X-gen methods, and others have been published uh, so that others can, can take advantage of those. Uh, the identification of the fifth um, case of HDLV3 in Cameroon. We've also been doing a lot of work uh, looking at novel biomarkers for hepatitis B, as is illustrated by this uh, paper by Emily Butler looking at pregenomic RNA. So the surveillance program uh, works by collaborating with labs and investigators around the world who may have access to unique cohorts or unique patient specimens that maybe don't fit the normal uh, paradigm, the diagnostics don't fit the chemical picture or different diagnostic assays are giving different results. Those are usually um, interesting samples to take a look at and try and understand what's going on. Um, obviously, the samples are tested and characterized with existing and novel um, techniques. Um, anything that is discovered is, is shared with our collaborators and with the community through peer-reviewed publications and personal communication with collaborators. And then novel, um, any novel strains are, are also published when we, when we find them. And we, as was illustrated in the previous slides, we are trying to help uh, local ministries of health or, or stakeholders to understand their, epidem excuse me, their epidemics um, at the local level. And all of this data really goes on to uh, fuel innovation, both in the development of novel, novel tests or novel applications or how these tests are used in the field. And we're very proud, and actually I'm, I'm very privileged and proud to be part of this program and to be uh, the, the, one, the only co uh, company to have a viral surveillance program of this scope and scale that's this, um, um, out, I would say, collaborative and transparent. So our partnerships um, are many, and as I said, they, they change over time. We, we work in numerous countries, and we've published um, many peer-reviewed papers, see, uh, uploaded more than 6,000 sequences to GenBank, and we've discovered many rare and new strains of uh, both HIV and hepatitis and also new viruses. So if anybody on this call is interested in collaborating or getting involved in this, please feel free to uh, reach out and contact us at globalsurveillance at abbott.com or contact your local rep, um, and they'll be able to put you in touch with the right person and will end up with me most likely. I'd like to thank um, our colleagues both uh, within Abbott uh, ID Core Research at UCSF at the Abbott um, Virus Discovery and Diagnostics Center. Um, our external collaborators in Congo and Cameroon are listed here, Nikis Ndambe, Lazar Kaptoui, Dora Mabene. So, and also the, our collaborators around the world in many of the other countries that we've described today. And that brings uh, my presentation to an end. And uh, with that, I'd uh, like to open it up uh, to the audience for any questions. Thank you, Dr. Clority, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of our webinar. Now, if you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen, and we will answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Okay, let's get started. We have some great questions coming in. <clears throat> Dr. Clority, let's start with this one. What is your view on the need to consider viral diversity in developed countries? I think it's uh, extremely important to con uh, consider viral diversity uh, regardless where you are. In, in developed countries, um, we're only a plane ride away 
from anywhere in the world, and, and it really is a global village. So with um, tourism, with you know, military deployment, with uh, you know, immigration, um, you don't really know where uh, viral infections have originated or have been acquired. So I think it's incredibly important, no matter where you are in the world, both in developed and developing countries. Now, Dr. Clordy, does prior knowledge suggest that divergence always comes from Africa or developing areas? Um, no, I think, you know, it, it definitely depends on the virus that we're talking about. And um, I think you'll see that uh, in the case of HIV, you know, it originated in, in Central West Africa, and so there, it's had the longest history there, and that uh, it, the close proximity, as we discussed, uh, to potential new zoonotic infections does drive a lot of diversity there. But the virus is changing and evolving in different ways um, in different parts of the world, and the, the epidemic in Africa looks very different than the epidemic in Asia and, and in the U.S., but there is evolution and shuffling of the deck, if you like, um, globally. What do you expect the next generation assays to accomplish that current ones don't? I think um, in the case of, of HIV and hepatitis, uh, there's a, a definite push to increase sensitivity uh, to diagnose people maybe in the acute phase to make sure that uh, in the case of hepatitis B, you've got a better detection of occult hepatitis B that might go undetected. Um, there's the ever-present need to have robust detection. So again, back to keeping pace with the evolution of the virus to make sure that we always detect those diverse strains. Thank you, Dr. Clorty. And it looks like we have time for one final question. Where do you see future generations of assays having most medical impact? Well, I think um, in the case of HIV, uh, the, the drive uh, for 1990-90, uh, the WHO uh, goal of, of detecting and having 90% uh, of people who are HIV positive knowing their status and then 90% of them on treatment and 90% of those people uh, successfully suppressed, you know, it all starts with diagnostics. So I think that's uh, going to be a, a key focus. You, you need to identify the patient so that they can be treated, um, suppressed, prevent further transmission. The same is really true um, in the viral hepatitis space where now there's curative therapies and we, there's um, a push to eliminate um, viral hepatitis or hepatitis C in particular. Uh, you know, by 2030, there's some very aggressive WHO goals as well. So diagnostics um, needs to be uh, robust everywhere uh, that it's performed and it's going to have uh, varying modalities from rapid test to core lab and molecular. So it's, it's definitely the diagnostic algorithm is evolving. It's not just the virus. Thank you, Dr. Clorty. And thank you again for your time today and your important research. We'd also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Abbott Diagnostics, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Those questions that we did not have time to answer today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand, and LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now, and we hope to see you again soon. Have a great day.